So can we start by having you say and spell your name? Yes, uh, my name is Rebecca Spence, uh, R-E-B-E-C-C-A-S-P-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Awesome. <laughs> So today is Wednesday, June 26th. Uh, we are at Haw River Farmhouse Ales, and we are talking with Rebecca Spence about um, For Well-Crafted NC. So Rebecca, thank you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? A little sure. bit about your background? Yes, um, so I live in Greensboro with my husband, um, and we moved out here 2015. Um, grew up down on the coast, moved out here to Greensboro in 2015, and I was trying to get back into the brewing industry. I had managed to find my way there early on in 2013, um, and it, it took a little while, but I eventually found Saxapaha, um, and the rest is kind of history. <laughs> awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you, how you got here. So what was kind of your first foray into brewing? Okay, yeah, um, so 2013, uh, well, probably should start 2012. So 2012 moved out to Greensboro to go to UNCG, mm -hmm. um, did a year there, and then over summer break, my best friend and I were living together. We moved back home to the coast on um, the Outer Banks, so Jarvisburg, Currituck area, and that's where the weeping radish is right now. So they had moved from Manio down to Currituck several years earlier. Um, through her, I ended up working over there. And that was my first experience. I started off front of house. So doing a lot of their retail beer sales, um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, retail beer sales, and then um, butchery stuff. And through that kind of got into craft beer a little bit more. So I got into a little bit right after I turned 21, but it wasn't, wasn't taking advantage of like the Greensboro beer culture yet. Um, so when we moved home, uh, started to get into a little bit more of that. And then they needed help back in the brewery because summers are obviously crazy down there. So they needed an extra pair of hands and I started off Beer Monkey washing kegs, filling liter bottles, washing liter bottles, um, kind of connecting the back and the front together. And that's how I got interested in craft beer and got into the beer industry at the same time. Um, I'll beat it in like a really small way, but it's great and it makes me happy obviously that uh, that's how the industry still works you can start small and then kind of work your way up and that's that's exactly what happened i was there in both capacities for a little while um, until we moved back out to greensboro a few years later and then from there i started home brewing doing a lot of spontaneous fermentation experiments things like that uh, food fermentation so kind of just wanting to grow my body of knowledge and experiment and play with the actual fermentation side of things. Uh, so a few years later, yeah, probably two years later, um, ended up following a buddy out here when they needed the help in the same capacity. So I beer monkeyed around until uh, they needed help as an assistant brewer. And here we are. Yeah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so you mentioned UNCG. What, what were you studying at UNCG? So I was doing, um, I was studying history actually. Okay. I studied history and I took a couple of their theater classes as well because that's always been like a, a corollary interest. So not anything sciencey, which is a little weird. That was always more of a side project for me. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was wondering. Uh, the <laughs> yeah. science background seems to be one that comes in pretty handy. So mm -hmm. you know. You, you talked about kind of starting. I guess you started mm -hmm. on an industrial system, then went home brewing, and then went back. Yeah, I have a really, it, it's a weird background when you look at it, because a lot of people either start from doing, like they start the school background, mm -hmm. they go and they do brewing, or brewing school, um, trade school, and then they jump right into the commercial side of it, or you've got home brewers who work your way up and you still jump in as brewer. Um, but yeah, mine was way back and forth. Started off doing, I didn't brew while I was there. I, start, I was able to help with a couple of small things regarding the brewing, um, but it was more cellaring and packaging and just kind of learning through, <laughs> through absorption. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of flip-flopped it around a little bit. Yeah. Um, so can you talk about some of the resources that you've drawn on just to learn and teach okay. yourself or learn from others yeah um, so I'm trying to think the first I do a lot of talking to people mm -hmm. uh, the assistant brewers wherever I go or the wherever I go the two breweries I've worked at <laughs> um, I've always been put 
right there with the assistant brewers, which is great because I they're mounds of res mounds of just information. You know, head brewers are more often than not busy. If you're lucky enough to have okay, head brewer, assistant brewer, and then your packaging crew, your seller crew, more more organization than most breweries have got because um, tight tight crews are around <laughs> around here. Um, but if you can glom on to somebody who knows and then just pick their brains. Um, so I did a lot of that with Chase when he was assistant brewer and then um, Corey was our assistant brewer over at the Weeping Radish. So got to talk to them a lot and then outside of being around people who I could kind of question like that, a lot of reading, um, some of the Brewers Association publications, mm -hmm. a lot of those books I really enjoy, still working my way through some of them. Um, Chase was nice enough to lend me some of his textbooks from <clears throat> from the Wake Tech program. So those have been really informative. And then like just, I mean, if you get a wild hair and want to know about loggers, like there are so many good resources online. Um, a lot of a lot of the more official websites have a, like more in-depth and science side of it, mm -hmm. which I really enjoy. Um, so that kind of stuff. And then uh, there's one other, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, Sandor Katz's Art of Fermentation has been really informative for me. Yeah. That's, that's what got me into a lot of different things. Um, kind of the, the missing piece from the history major and then that's got a lot of cultural stuff. So that got me inter interested in more of the, it bridged the gap and got me interested in the science side of it. So from there on could go on and use it as a, a jumping off point. Lots of books, lots yeah. of podcasts, lots of talking to people. <laughs> yeah. So here at Hall River, you know, the beers are mainly Belgians. Mm -hmm. um, Weeping Radish is mostly lagers. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the differences there and maybe some of the differences, not necessarily in terms of style, but we can mm -hmm. go into that too, um, but process. Yeah. And your, your role in that. Oh, turnaround time is the biggest one that people think about. Um, so lagers take, they, they're cold fermented um, and it takes, you know, different different process from fermentation side. Brewing is, is mostly the same for both lagers and ales, depend, until you get into specific kinds of ales, specific kinds of lagers. Um, but yeah, you're looking at like a, a six to eight week turnaround uh, cellar time for lagers. And then for ales, you know, two to four depending. So it's, <laughs> it, it's a different kind of product too. You know, uh, yeah. lagers are associated with being a lot more crisp, a lot more light. Um, but that's probably the biggest, the biggest difference that I've noted between the two of them. Yeah. So as a, as a history nerd, when you were working at Weeping Radish, mm -hmm. were you aware uh, like of yeah. the history of the place where you were working? Is that part yeah. of the culture there? Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's, um, it's not necessarily something that gets talked about on a daily basis, but they've got tours that come through. So you get to hear that a lot. They've got, um, a wall that, de uh, details, North Carolina breweries by year, so you can kind of see the growth um, over time. But yeah, with with Uli being kind of the grandfather of it all, yeah, it's it's very present. Um, and for me, it's a really historical area anyway. Mm -hmm. So I was looking into that stuff to begin with, and then especially with them initially being rooted in Mantio, you know, you start looking at any history over there, bring it up to the present, you're going to run across like mile markers like that. It's kind of kind of cool. Um, Plus their new location, well, new location, but where they are um, on the mainland now is about five minutes from my house. So it was, <laughs> it was very present and I did a lot of looking into it prior to, um, but yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your process here mm -hmm. at Haw River. What does, what does the brewing cycle look like here? Okay. Let's see. Particularly from um, your perspective. For me? Oh, okay. So I started off more doing cellar stuff to begin with, um, to kind of learn and, and work into the co production side a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, it, it comes in more on the, uh, well, starting from the back end, honestly. Like, it's a weird way to think about it. But if we... Like I started off doing more work with finished beer. 
So bright tank on, kegging, things like that, um, making sure our carbonation levels are right, and some flavor adjustments that happen um, on the end of the process there. And that was where I kind of got started um, with Haw River, doing more of that finished product type stuff under, under direction, and then working forward towards the actual like, okay, you start with the brewing and then working it through the different, you got brewing, then the fermentation process, and then the finishing, uh, you know, secondary fermentation and packaging kind of deal. Um, so I kind of learned it backwards. But yeah, looking at it now, it's very nice to be able to be with the beer from start to finish and then learning a little bit more about the science that goes on in the middle of it. Right. Which I like. So. <laughs> and I, I was going to say, and I have a sneaking suspicion I know the answer to this already, but what's your favorite part of brewing? Yeah, that's probably it. Um, the, the fermentation and just because it's, it's fascinating to see how it's different from beer to beer. Um, and it makes me realize there's so much that I don't know about it. If you're thinking about it from a, like a molecular level up, you know, it's really, you, you don't see a lot of that, but I love knowing that it's going on and knowing that all of these different factors that we have a hand in from start all the way through to fermentation, um, affect how the beer is going to finish, how it's going to develop in the tank and then how it's going to finish. Um, yeah, fermentation is, is definitely <laughs> the most fascinating part of the process for me. Brewing is a ton of fun and uh, the cellar and the packaging, that's the hard work part. Um, but, but I very much enjoy the care of with the yeast and the right. work as fermentation goes on. Um, how about the opposite end? What, are, what, what is one of your, it, it can't all be sunshine. What's your least True. favorite part? Uh, <laughs> I think most people um, in, in the brewing industry can probably relate to this one. It's the seller logistics, so to speak. Um, you, you package the beer and then you have to have somewhere to put it. Like <laughs> somewhere that's going to be organized, somewhere that's going to be the right temperature so that it is the same product that went into kegs when somebody here or down the road takes it out of the kegs. Mm -hmm. um, so after care of the beer is something that I have had to make an effort to make a lot, be way more mindful of, um, because was, you know it's very easy to be like, okay, it's done. And I was like, no, yeah. <laughs> you still have to take care of that. You put so much work into it. Um, so yeah, the logistics after the fact are definitely not as wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't say I don't like it because right. I like waited a long time to be in the industry. So right, right, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about some uh, specific styles and specific beers. Yes. So do you have a specific style of beer that's really like your favorite to brew? Um, here, here versus at home are, are kind of two different answers. Like I love brewing and making mixed culture beers at home because um, you get to play with it and it's way more, way more unencumbered, you know? Mm -hmm. You know to a degree what you're gonna get, but there's a lot of stuff that is just wild and wonderful. Um, so you can play with it, plus you're not worrying about contaminating anything, which is something that's just completely different on a production side. Um, so that's the fun part. Mixed culture of sours at home, definitely my favorite. Here, I've really enjoyed getting to work with some of our darker beers, because um, that was something I did more at, at home, a lot of stuff. That's what my family likes to drink. So the, like the Java Berry Cream Stout, the St. Benedict's Breakfast Double, and then some of our two barrel stuff, love brewing on our two barrel system. I could probably say anything we brew over there, um, but we've done a couple of hybrid beers. I think of them as hybrid beers, like beer to guards. So we're using our Saison yeast and then cold fermenting it like you would a lager. So it really pulls from both traditions that I'm familiar with, um, or Belgian becoming more familiar with, but you get to do the German side of it with the lagering process, which, you know, pulls in my heartstrings. Um, <laughs> and then stuff that is very Haw River. Um, and that's, those are probably my favorite, favorite yeah. styles to do professionally. <laughs> so you use the phrase very Haw River. How would you define <laughs> a Haw River beer? Oh, uh, well, initially, like right out the gate, you know, anything Belgian styles, and especially if you're looking at Saisons in particular, because I wasn't overly familiar with Saisons coming into this brewery and it was like, okay, I have some research to do. Um, and then just paying a lot of attention to the hands-on learning part because it's, it's different. 
yes, they're ales, but they are like, to me, they're more mindfully crafted because you're looking at that Belgian firm house tradition. So especially when you come into like some of the mixed culture stuff that we do, it harkens back to that quite a bit, but yes. And you mentioned, you know, you mentioned home brewing and mm-hmm. playing around there. What are some of your favorite things that you've played around with at home? Whether they worked or not? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's part of the fun of playing around yeah. with it, I guess. Um, I'm trying to diversify, or I am trying, did try as well. Um, you don't get as much time after you do it professionally to do it at home. But uh, played around with trying to diversify the different styles I was brewing. So getting to know some different strains of yeast and um, malts, especially. I need to need to keep expanding my hop repertoire. I usually reference our resident IPA expert for that. <laughs> so, but um, let's see. I would say probably, so recently uh, I had a, a gift beer that I brewed for somebody and it was a stout, it was an imperial stout that we aged on red red wine soaked wood chips and added cocoa nibs and secondary fermentation. And that was probably one of my favorite ones that we've done. Um, just be, I say we, my husband helped collaborate on that beer. Uh, but that was probably one of my favorite ones so far just because execution was a lot better and it was weird it was a bunch of stuff we hadn't tried before on the homebrew scale but outside of that um i did a, a sour bar not a sour a um, mixed fermentation barley wine that aged out to be pretty fun yeah um kind of to go back to the history piece mm. of things um when, when you're working on the beers particularly at home are you mm-hmm. thinking about like historical beers and how things have come along. Have you tried any of those? So those are definitely on my list. Yeah. Um, Right now I have done more, oh gosh, and it's been a while. It wasn't necessarily a beer. It was more of like a, well, there have been several more historical, more culturally rooted uh, fermentations that I've done, Mm -hmm. but they weren't, like I said, they weren't necessarily malt-based beverages. Um, But it definitely is something that when I'm, looking into building out a recipe i go back and i look at how things have been done throughout the years and whether you're trying to do you know an accurate representation of the style or if you're trying to go sideways a little bit i think that information is really useful to have because it's going to tell you it's going to connect you to that beer for one which is something that's important to me as as a crafter um you know having a connection to your product or whatever it is that you're doing um and yeah, the, some of the historical beers, I love looking through those recipes and reading them. And it, it, it's informed a couple of the things that you know, we do here. Everybody here is pretty good about that research aspect. But yes, I have got some of those on my list of want to do, um, especially some of the, like the molasses beers and the more herbal, some of the weird recipes. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're in the books for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any, can you think of any specific examples of kind of maybe how something like that was incorporated into a beer here at Haw River? Let's see, um, a lot of times it's gonna be in like our pins and the Tyrians that we do, little one-offs that we break off from the big batches. The, so I say that and then the, the one I think of doesn't have anything to do with those. Um, <laughs> but, but like when you're looking at the, we did a, a sage and, or we have coming up, it's a sage and strawberry Newlands pin that we did. Um, and part of the sage came from, well, we've got it down there, but when we're looking into how to use it, I'll go through, um, there's a book called Sacred and Herbal Healing Beers, and it's got a lot of really weird, like one-off recipes going back, you know, they're written in the old English, and it's not telling you pounds or ounces or whatever, it's saying, you know, one T-U-N-N-E, okay, now I have to look up what that is and see what the reference is for, okay. Um, but they have a section on sage, they've got all this different weird stuff, you know. Um, so I'll go and I'll look into that and if we've got an idea from either Chase says, oh, I've got this at home or we've got it here, uh, looking at, at that and seeing how other people have used it and kind of letting that maybe inform um, uh, measurements to some degree. So it takes a little extra research when it's that old, but it's part of the fun for me. Yeah. Um, and when we did the, the beer de garde on the two barrel system, 
that one, I definitely went back and I looked and said, okay, well, this Saison's we know about, you know, but what specifically about the beer de garde has been, what's, what's been representative of that beer throughout the years? What makes it different from Saison's or like a Grisette or a Goza or something? Um, and then use that to build out my recipe to try and make it really representative of the style. Yeah. So putting on your forward thinking, <laughs> where, where do you see, you know, brewing today is a lot different from when you first started at Weeping Radish. Oh yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the changes that have happened, but also kind of how you see the trends moving forward? Yeah. Um, so it was very much IPAs when I was first in the brewing brewery setting. Um, and with that being said, they were, Weeping Radish wasn't necessarily like jumping on and do it. It's the same here. Um, we don't necessarily jump on every trend that comes along, but we've got stuff that is representative of the overall beer culture worked into our own personal credos. So like you will have uh, the sun hands that we've got on right now is a good example, you know, hoppy stuff being really popular, but it's still a Belgian golden strong. Mm -hmm. um, so with the stuff that that's popular, that was popular then, um, I mean, yeah, IPAs always, <laughs> uh, and, and not being, not having been on the production side of it, um, then I couldn't really inform a whole lot as to the individual ingredients and stuff. Um, but one thing that was, that was cool to see from the production standpoint was that's when they started using more North Carolina malts. Um, they got one of Riverbend's first shipments when they first opened up, which was super cool. And then to see that perpetuate through to today, you know, now you've got a lot more local maltsters um, and a lot of people using them. Uh, but style-wise in the future, I, I'm excited that people are getting excited about lagers. Um, a lot of the at, the, at the festivals, you're seeing people pouring a lot more lagers. You're seeing better representations of that style come through. People are getting creative. I'm a little, I'm a little apprehensive to see like a bubble gum or, a, you know, something crazy. We see this, all these crazy things that are sometimes really good. Um, but like when people start to get creative with the loggers, I think they're going to find out how much different um, the yeast, they, the brewers know, they know how it is, but like, <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see it's how. It's a bit less forgiving. Yeah. That, thank you. That's a better way to put it. Yeah. A uh, little, I don't know if it's less wiggle room, but it's going to be interesting to see when people start to get super creative with it and adding a bunch of adjuncts. Um, kind of excited to see how that rolls. Yeah. But yeah, new, that and new and exciting styles of IPAs. I mean, they've got the um, uh, more wine informed styles. I'm seeing a lot now is starting out West again, uh, wine and champagne informed styles. So that'll be very interesting. Yeah. So, you know, I don't have to tell you that craft brewing is traditionally a male dominated field, even though if you're a good history student, you know, it roots back to women. Alewives. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, can you talk a little bit about being a woman in an industry that's more male dominated? Yeah. Maybe some of the challenges or even benefits that come from that? Oh, for sure. The um, it, it actually, it was part of the draw for me initially because I've always been very comfortable. I grew up as a tomboy. Um, I had my sister and then like one other female friend. So I was really used to hanging out with all the guy cousins and everything. Um, so it was a place I was comfortable with. And throughout the growth in the, in the industry, I've got to say it's been a particularly, um, I haven't had some of the experiences that other women have had in the industry, especially when you look at some of the stories coming out in um, other states. North Carolina has a good culture for women insofar as my experience has been. Um, and for a lot of the other female brewers and bartenders and just salespeople, everyone within the industry I've spoken with um, by and large has not had anything overly negative to say. Um, being in the brewery, particularly, the here, I will say, oh, I will say here has been really nice because the guys back there 
do they don't treat you differently because you're a woman as long as you know like with any other job and with anybody else as long as you can demonstrate that you know what you're doing and you're competent um, I haven't had any instances of sexism anybody being patronizing nothing so far um, there are definitely definitely places out there outside of the brewing industry where I've had that happen so it's been really refreshing and kind of surprising given that it is really a male dominated place um, no uh, but it's been really informative for me not having those experiences getting involved with organizations like pink boots where you have a lot of women from various sectors in the beer industry coming together and talking about their experiences and you know even though my experience hasn't ha has been overly positive uh, it's been really good to hear the stories of other people and be able to say okay well if that's happening to somebody else you know not only is it something to keep an eye on as you go and you are at other places um, and support your your fellow females in the industry but to kind of look at it and say okay well if that's happening what can we do to fix it um, then that that's been great yeah and pink boots in north carolina has been like booming recently yeah there's lots of regional groups and did, you did a presentation for the triad group recently didn't yes you? yes oh man it was a lot of fun um i'm so excited to finally have a chapter in greensboro because it's well triad because we've got winston and everybody in there too um but yeah it's it's such a different beer community out there than it is out here more towards Raleigh. I mean, mm -hmm. we're kind of smack dab in the middle, but it's, it's a lot smaller and probably because I'm more familiar with the area too, but everybody is more condensed and there are fewer breweries that more now that they're popping up, um, but everybody kind of knows each other. It's a very communal feeling. Um, so it was really nice. Like I have, I knew Christina from Joymongers. I'd met her through Pink Boots, but I didn't realize that they also have a female brewer over at Pryor as well. So, that's really nice getting to know the other people, not only in the beer community, but specifically the women. Um, it's, yeah, every meeting for the Pink Boots that I have been to, whether it be Raleigh Chapter or now Greensboro and, and Winston-Salem, um, has been super edifying and just really encouraging, really a, a lot of fun, to be honest. You, just, you get to go and you get to exchange ideas and, and problem solve a little bit. Yeah. So it's, it's very cool to meet other people, other women in the industry. Yeah. And um, I think I would assume that having kind of that localized, mm -hmm. even more so than just a statewide group, oh, yeah. helps out a lot too. Yeah, it is. And on a professional level as well, because these are the people where, you know, oh, well, we don't, we're, we're missing a bag of dextrose. Okay, well, I've got, you know, uh, so-and-so around the corner. Maybe they can lend us one. Yeah. So if we had uh, some uh, uh, woman walk through right now and say, mm -hmm. I want to become a brewer, what would be your advice for her? Oh man, um, I would probably say, read as much as you can ahead of time. Make sure that you understand what you're getting into because it's, I've experienced it with like guys and, and with women. Um, they come into the brewing industry thinking, hey, I'm gonna be brewing that's actually like the smallest part of the job <laughs> um uh yeah talk to i would say talk to people read um and like find somebody who homebrews and jump in on that like go go with them through the recipe building process through all of the nitty-gritty through the equipment setup like that's a more accurate representation of the level of effort you're going to be expending because brewing on a big system is it's still work and it's still attention to detail, but it's a lot easier than it is a homebrew system because you have to set up and right. you have to, you are responsible for everything and you have to jerry rig it. And that's a huge part of this job. <laughs> Rolling with it and making it work are like the key phrases. Um, yeah, do the research, walk through the brewery, come and experience a day of cake washing if they take deliveries um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> I promise the ceiling won't fall through <laughs> um, but yeah go and volunteer for a day and and wash kegs or do whatever grunt work it is that they need doing because that's going to be an accurate representation of life in a brewery yeah. it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of creativity but it's a lot of actual physical work too so know what you're getting into <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh 
We've got a, a few kind of fun questions at uh -oh. the end. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite beer here to drink? Oh, Not man. to brew, but yeah, to yeah, enjoy. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy Darius the Giant. It is our red, it's a red sour base. Uh, we use a Flemish ale blend in it. And then it's, it's, it's for like a year plus on mounds of cherries in a bourbon barrel. So it's, it's just a beautiful sour. I mean, it's tart, it's acidic, but it's balanced on the multi side. Um, it appeals to that like funky heart that I've got. <laughs> love the clean beers, but man, I really love some funk. Um, and it's just really well done. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So what about outside of here? Do you have uh, favorite oh, yeah. beers mm -hmm. from North Carolina breweries other than here? Absolutely. Um, I really, I enjoy a lot of Old Hickory stuff. Um, and right now, well, right now, because it's summer, um, a, lot of it, a lot of the places that have outdoor seating are nice. I'm, I'm saying right now because I've been staying in Greensboro. <laughs> so, um, but one way or another, uh, I love Joymonger stuff. Mm -hmm. I'll go over there and hang out. Their crew is great. Their beer is wonderful. I haven't been over to the Barrel Hall yet. I'm excited to go travel to Winston and do a little bit of that. Um, but yeah, they're always, they have one of my favorite fooder cultures going right now um, from anywhere I've had. It's stellar. And plus they are already brewing lagers, which is a big plus. Yeah. <laughs> and they do it well. Yes. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm a little bit, like I told Chase, I'm a little bit of a lazy beer drinker to some degree. If it's close by, I'm more likely to try it. But <laughs> that, means, that means Winston and that means Greensboro and that means, that means I need to get out to the Raleigh area more. <laughs> But, but there's good stuff in Winston and Greensboro. Too. Oh, absolutely. But there's tons of killer stuff. Steel string, Zebulon. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what do you do when you're not brewing? Or home? Or are you home brewing? home brewing when you're not here? Oh, I would love to home brew more. <laughs> yes. Um, my husband's a small business owner, so I help him out a lot with whatever he needs doing. And then it's we're kind of boring. We just pretty much, <laughs> we got a, a house and a yard and dogs to take care of. Um, and then we're, we're big old nerds. So we're possibly at a brewery playing magic or at our house playing Dungeons and Dragons or yeah, we're, we're giant children. <laughs> we like to literally drink beer and play games. <laughs> that sounds like a good time. Yeah, I'm with it. <laughs> Well, those are all the questions that I came prepared. Is there anything Ooh. that we haven't talked about that you would want to talk about just in terms of telling your whole story? Nothing I can necessarily think of. Um, yeah, yeah. Love beer, love making beer. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate I enjoyed it. it. <laughs>